Hello and welcome to Doug's Front Porch, a podcast where I get to sit down with friends, old and new, and have honest conversations. I'm really excited tonight to welcome to the front porch Phil Wirt. And full disclosure, Phil is my second cousin, his mom and my dad are first cousins. So I've known Phil my whole life uh, and we are blood relation. And he's the first guest that I've had on that is family. Uh, but he has such an interesting story, I think, and I can't wait to pick his brain on a couple things. And I'm just so happy that you agreed to come on. Phil, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, no problem. Uh, I'm uh, very much looking forward to it. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about normally I start off with talking about like childhood stuff, but I think the a cool part of your life story is your college experience and you left high school and you decided you wanted to major in archaeology, correct? Uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of the plan. Um what what made you what was it about archaeology that drew you to that as as something you wanted to study? Well, it's probably somebody that you know because we most likely had them as a teacher. Okay. Um, Mr. Bob Miller, my sixth grade oh yeah, social studies teacher uh, was um, I, I'd always been kind of interested in um, I don't know what you want to say like the less uh, black and white parts of school, meaning, you know, math and uh, science and so forth. I was more of like a humanities kind of liberal arts kind of minded person. And I remember very specifically doing a unit uh, in sixth grade on uh, ancient Egypt. And uh, of course, I, I knew a little bit, but uh, not to that degree. And, you know, it really kind of set set myself in motion and and uh getting interested in that also being a little bit of a of a of a video game geek and uh that kind of a thing and playing a lot of uh dungeons and dragons in my basement with my buddies um which now is apparently like really hip if, uh, yeah you yeah know, <laughs> you know um if you do that but back then it was you know something that you did you know do in your basement you keep it in the basement but right, uh right. <laughs> but uh <laughs> Uh, that kind of really spurred my interest. And, you know, when I got to high school, I really couldn't think of anything else that I wanted to study in college uh, other than something along those lines. And so um, it kind of became almost like, a, you know, a, a goal that I was going to try to accomplish regardless of who was going to tell me that it wasn't going to work out or that I wouldn't find a job or whatever. I've heard it all. Right, um, right. And so, uh, you know, I ended up just looking into programs. You know, this is way back in the dark ages before we had the Internet. Uh, and so applying to college was done, you know, on paper and through your guidance counselor's office and stuff like that to help you with your transcript. Um, but uh, I ended up um, going to school for a, a major in anthropology with a with a sub concentration in archaeology. Okay. And then uh, where did you go to school for that? Well, I, uh, I graduated from Penn State main campus. And uh, so, you know, go, uh, go Nittany Lions. <laughs> um, and, uh, and ended up ha getting a job before I actually graduated. So kind of worked out in, in that regard. And you actually got to go on some digs then eventually, didn't you? Uh, many, many, many. Um, so, so can you tell us maybe about like one that was, you know, like your favorite one or one that was extremely interesting or even like, what is that like? I think most people, when they hear the word archaeologist, that they, they just have the idea of like Indiana Jones in their mind. And it is definitely not, Indi you know, Indiana Jones, right? Uh, no. And quite honestly, Indiana Jones is a horrible archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cause, uh, yeah, what he does is called looting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know, the, the, the romantic romanticization, I can't even speak. Uh, uh, I think, you know, you, you know what I mean? Um, of, of what those movies portray as archeology span to be is really not even a little bit accurate. I mean, 90% of the time when you're in the field, you, you know, you're not really doing much of anything other than what I could categorize only as like, say grunt work, uh -huh. um, like literally hard physical labor with a, with a shovel and a bucket and a wheelbarrow and, and things like that. 
And then, you know, if you've ever seen those shows on PBS or, you know, there's a really good uh, British show called, uh, what called Time, Time Travelers or something like that. I can't remember. Um, but uh, where they kind of show up at the very end when everything has been prepped and, you know, oh, and what is this guy doing? And like, oh, he's uncovering this, this you know, this beautiful grave site. And uh, let's see what's going on. And they hop down in the pit and they get the camera down there. And, and it took, you know, I don't know, two, three, four weeks to get to that point. Right. Um, a pretty mundane, uh, uh, boring stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of countries, especially in Western Europe and the United States and Canada, uh, they all have laws in place. Uh, sometimes here in the United States, sometimes federal laws. We have something called Section 106 um, of the Federal Law Code that uh, basically dictates that if federal monies are used in order to develop something like uh, like a new, you know, uh, a new dam or uh, uh, you know, interstate highway system or something like that. Uh, you need to do two things. You need to do a cultural resource management study and you need to do an environmental impact study and to see if you're, you know, blowing through an Indian burial ground or disrupting an endangered species habitat or something like that. So when I worked, when I worked out of college, I worked for a company based in Maryland that did what we call CRM or cultural resource management, which is tied to these federal laws and sometimes state laws, because you can go to some states like Virginia, for instance, where their cultural preservation laws are really, really stringent and they go above and beyond the federal mandates. Um, and But then you can go to some other states where it's actually kind of loosey-goosey and other than the federal, the federal guidelines, there's really not a whole heck of a lot that they additionally ask you to do. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I, I got shipped around, uh, you know, the eastern United States and Midwest and the southeast and did a whole bunch of archaeology for about two years there before going on to grad school. Yeah, let's talk about grad school because you didn't go the normal route, did you? I did not. Um, I, I, I wish I could remember exactly how the idea got planted in my head, but I, I just don't. And, you know... Uh, I, at that point in my life, I'd only been overseas once. I'd been to Spain, and um, I'd always wanted to do some more traveling. And I thought to myself, well, why don't you know, I knock off two birds with one stone? And because my field of study was not something that I needed like a state license in, like being a doctor or a lawyer or something, you know, an idea got in my head that if I went overseas for a graduate degree, I could travel a little bit, I could experience living in another country for a little while, and also earn an additional, an additional professional degree. And so that's what I did. Uh, and I ended up um, attending the University of Sheffield in Sheffield, England, in Northern England uh, for two years for a master's degree. So I was over there earning a degree. And then I did not only work, um, they've got very similar laws, by the way. And so the university had their own for-profit con contracting service that I worked for while I was a student there and did work. And um, then I moved to London and got a job working for a company that did uh, cultural resource management, or sometimes they call it salvage archaeology uh, in London. And I did that for a little while. And um, I then tried to formally apply for a working permit because um, between you, me, and whoever's listening, I, I was working a little bit under the table. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, that process, if you're, if you're, well, here's the deal. If you're in a native English speaker in a native English speaking country, to a large degree, immigration law does not favor you. Okay. Be because you are typically looked on as someone who could very easily and legitimately take a job away from someone else uh -huh. <laughs> who is a citizen. So uh, not to be too much of a cynic here, but, you know, if I wanted to drive a cab or clean someone's house, you know, it probably would have been a little bit easier versus trying to secure a white collar position being a native English speaker. And that's no knock on, you know, British immigration law. Uh, but uh, that's just simply what what the reality of it is. What was that like when you got over there? You know, it's like f kind of like your first serious 
time away from home because it was, you know, it was it was a long term investment. You left the United yeah. States, you get to England, you know, all right, I have two years here in this foreign country. Uh, was the welcome warm? Was it a difficult um, cultural shift? I mean, the English English culture isn't all that much different from American culture in a lot of ways. In some yeah. ways, it is, of course. Yes but did no. you did you have uh, was it a difficult transition? Was it an easy transition? Um. Well, here, the difficult thing was I made this decision to go to a country I'd never been to, to go to a school I'd never visited, <laughs> to, a, to go into a program. You know, I didn't know a soul. I didn't know right. anybody in the country. I didn't know anybody at the university. I literally got on a plane one day and left. And, you know, it's funny. My parents dropped me off at the bus stop in Allentown because I flew out of JFK and we were late. And so I literally had these bags of all my stuff that I was going to use to live for two years. Right. Um, and they kind of dropped me off and it was like the quickest goodbye of my life. <laughs> I had no idea when I was going to see my parents again or my family or whatever. And it was kind of like, see you later, goodbye. And I got on a bus to go to New York city to get on a plane. And when I'm on the bus, I remember this very distinctly. I get on the bus and um, there was hardly anybody on the bus. And there was an older lady that was sitting a couple of seats away from me. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I was, I think I was 20, 21, I think it was like 21, 22. And uh, I started, you know, I guess what you could say, have a panic attack. Uh-huh. Um, I started, you know, like, you know, feeling faint and I was sweating and I was, you know, like, you know, and this lady looked over and she said, are you okay? And I said, I'm not really sure if I'm okay. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I'm, you know, I'm getting on a plane and move to another country I've never been to. I don't know anybody. I said, I think I might be making a mistake here. And, um, I'll never forget this. She looked at me and she said, she asked me this. She said, how many people told you you'd never get to this point? Huh. And it was funny because leading up to that, when I told a bunch of people that I was going to go overseas for grad school, the amount of people that told me, yeah, you're going to apply and get accepted and you're not going to go because you're not going to have, you know, the testicular fortitude in order to do it. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, it'll be a nice little story to tell people that you applied and got accepted to foreign university, but you're never going to take the plunge. And she said, well, here you are on your way to the airport. So in a lot of ways, you kind of you know, you, you've kind of accomplished more than most people give you credit for. And she said, on top of that, if you get there and hate it, you turn around and come home. Yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, you signed up for the military or, or, you know, you're serving a prison sentence where you can't get out of it or something. Um, so that kind of really put my mind at ease. And I don't know why she felt the need to, you know, extend that, that, that level of, of grace to, toward me. Right, but, right. Um, she did and I'll never forget it. That's crazy. That's but, a great story. Yeah. I mean, but to answer your question, I mean, I got to give the university a lot of credit because and man, this was a, one of the smartest decisions I ever made. I went a week early before classes started. It was an option. You didn't have to do it. It was international student orientation. Uh huh. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should do this, you know, to get a head start. And I did that, and to this very day, some of my best friends are people I met in that program. Um, so, because uh, it was every kid in the same boat from literally every corner of the planet was there. Because you know, uh, Sheffield University is a large international university, like a Penn State or a Harvard or a Michigan or whatever, and. Um, so I met people from every stretch. A lot of them were European kids in, now I don't even think this is a program anymore. Maybe you're familiar with it, but there used to be a program through the EU. I think it was called the Erasmus program. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that's still running or not, but when I studied in Germany, all the European students that were studying with me were all on Erasmus scholarships or, or, right. or a lot of them were. Yeah. Yep. 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 And so a lot of the kids I met were Erasmus students for, that were basically going to England to, to a large degree, improve their English skills. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, but there were other kids there for, 
um, uh, full degrees like I was. A lot of Erasmus students were studying abroad, and so they'd be there for either uh, half a, a semester or a year. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, interestingly enough, you know, I met a, a number of Americans there, and the the department at the university, the Department of Archaeology at Sheffield is one of the most preeminent programs in the world. Uh, and so it draws people from all over the world to study there. And there were a number of Americans in my program with me um, and in the department and at the university just in general. Because if you think about it, a lot of American students, you know, um, I teach high school, you teach high school. When do American students ever think about actually pursuing a college degree overseas? Right. Never. You know, Um, so these were mostly graduate students or or kids studying abroad from their their undergraduate programs back home. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the transition was easy, yet not. And I hate to be, you know, coy about it. Um, But what I what I tell people about about living in Britain is, yeah, the, the, the language is the same. And yeah, we, we get exposed to the accents on TV programs now and, you know, that type of a thing. Um, but it's the little things that you would never expect are different that stand out. Sure. Uh, like, you know, the electric plugs being different and everything running on 220 versus 110. Um, and so your electronics not working unless you've got a proper converter. And, you know, words being spelled differently that you've never, you know, you've heard people speak these words on TV, but you've never seen them written in British English from British, British vernacular. And having been having to be forced to write all of my my papers in British English with British spelling. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so I I remember going into like Microsoft Word and like putting the default language to British English. So when the spell check hit, I actually knew I was getting it wrong. (laughs) Right. Right. Um. But uh, yeah, it, it was. I felt, I felt very secure and, and safe after that first week or so, feeling like I had been tossed into, um, you know, a bin full of people in the same boat that they didn't know anybody, um, and so you all become very fast friends very quickly. Yeah. Because they don't know anybody. Um, you know. Uh, so I had it was it was interesting when I was there. Um, I remember being there for a week or two and then us getting information about them doing sort of like a, you know, the, every, every school does this in the United States. Like, you know, you start your semester as a freshman or any, any given year, and you can go to some place where they're having like a fair about clubs you can join uh-huh. and stuff like that. Well, what a lot of Americans don't realize is that college athletics everywhere else in the world is basically like club sports correct yep. for american students so if you want to play intercollegiate athletics you just join there's no there's no such thing as athletic scholarships there's no such thing as tryouts you know and i thought to myself so i go to this fair and all the clubs are there you know and then all the th- athletic teams are there and i said to myself you know what is something that i could do here that it would be pretty difficult back home Oh, I'll join the cricket club. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I joined the Sheffield University Cricket Club. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, so when I was there, I had my archaeology friends, my, my, my classmates. I had my international student friends that were studying all sorts of things that I met the first week I was there. And then I had my, my cricket chums. <laughs> Um, and they used to, um, I remember the first time I showed up at, they don't call it, they don't call it practice. Um, they call it nets, you know, we, you, are you going to, are you going to come to nets meaning practice? Okay. Okay. So, um, I show up at practice and they're like, Oh, you're the American that we met at, uh, at the fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here for, uh, I'm, you know, I joined and you told me this is when the first practice was Oh, here I am. Like oh, okay, and I was kind of a novelty for the first couple of practices because they thought I was just, you know, you know, feeding them a line of bull about yeah. uh, being dedicated to it. And I kept showing up, and I kept showing up, and I kept showing up. And so 
uh, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm one of the boys. Um, I would say this, if I want to, if, if I'm going to overly generalize, you know, um, it was, a, it was a little hard to get to know the actual British. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the, the culture is much warmer than I think a lot of people give it credit for. It's not nearly as aloof as it's perhaps maybe portrayed on TV or in movies, but I would say that the 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 definition of warmth is different than it is to an American, you know. And but but I gotta say, you know, I was in I was in the UK just maybe like two years ago. Things are changing because of course culture is dynamic and never stays the same. Right. Um, but uh, you know. Like physical contact, meaning um, other than maybe perhaps like a quick handshake, you know, you'd never go in for like, you know, a bro hug or something or whatever, or slap someone on the back unless you were really drunk. Um, but uh, that's sort of changing a little bit. And I think it's got a lot to do with, you know, American popular culture's influence. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say it, it felt different. And I have a very close friend um, who also went to our same high school, who currently is a professor at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And he recently came home. I hadn't seen him in over three years. And he basically said the same thing, that uh, after three years, he had it. He found it a little difficult to feel very close to some of his British colleagues. Mm, okay. Uh, and again, it, it's no knock because trust me, I have a, a super deep love and affinity for Br- Britain and British culture because of my experiences there. Because um, if, if that's the one bad thing I have to say, there's about a million good things I have to say right, about right, the experience. Right. right. That's great. Uh, it's, it's yeah. I mean, I studied abroad. I had when you're telling these stories, a lot of memories of of my time abroad came flooding back. Um, we share that commonality, but yeah, it, it is, it's interesting. And I wish more Americans, and I tell all my students too, like, if you have the opportunity, even if it's just a semester, go. Cause you learn, uh, at least from my perspective, I'm sure this was the same for you, but I learned so much more in my time abroad, not necessarily about, I mean, I went over to improve my German skills and, and, you know, to, to become as proficient as possible. And that was the underlying goal. But what I, when I came home, what I what I realized the most, especially now years later, is that I learned more about myself and how I deal with adversity and and difficult situations, or just being put into a situation where you don't know anybody at all. You're you're a thousand plus miles away from home, and like you said, pre internet days, you can't just text home and get an it you know an instant notification from somebody. So I really I, I really learned a lot about how to survive on my own. Um, and, and like similar to you as well, some of my greatest friendships, uh, that are still present were created through international students that were in the exact same boat that I was in, just like you. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. I, um, I always say that, you know, I, if I had to like, you know, put my life up until this point and I'm almost 45 at this point, you know, six more weeks and I'm 45 years old. Uh, I, you know, I kind of say, like, you know, there's there's pre Sheffield and there's post Sheffield. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, and when I was there, I, I ended up integrating, you know, very easily. You know, I, I took to the British culture you know, really easily um, and I found the pace of life very attractive. Um, I traveled a lot around the continent when I was there. And um, all things being the same at that point, anyway, if I could have figured out a way how to stay for a little bit longer, I probably would have. Um, And when I came home, uh, it took me, I don't even know, it took me quite a while to readjust. Uh Um, Mm -hmm. Reverse culture shock is a real thing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, It, you know, it's, I remember my dad getting ticked off at me because you know something is, I don't even think of something I said it was I don't maybe it was I don't remember and um he kind of got miffed at me because uh um you know he said you, you know you're home now you should be glad you're home and here you are kind of like just wishing you were back you know on the other side of the ocean like what's the big deal like you know I didn't know it was so bad here mm-hmm. 
Uh, and I was like, well, it wasn't that, um, but it's, and, and again, the older you get, you realize that any experience you have or any place that you live, it's, it's, it's hardly ever the place. It's the people sure. of that place. And so because I really had so many good experiences there, um, you know, the, the city of Sheffield itself, I mean, um, there's not a whole heck of a lot of things you would go there for <laughs> mm-hmm. um, if you were a tourist uh, of, of, of Britain. Um, you know, it's the fourth largest city in England, but, um, it's, it's a working man's city, you know? Uh, but, um, yeah, it was, it was the overall experience that sort of still in my in my own mind to this very day. I mean, I've got like a very, very warm, you know, I, I donate to the university every year, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, I, I get a very polite call every November from someone that stayed up to like one or two o'clock in the morning to call their, their, their American alumni to politely ask for a donation. Um, and, uh, which by the way, like, um, that's, you know, British folks are never good at asking for money. That is not a characteristic of, <laughs> of their culture. Um, they, they'll donate heartily. Uh, but, um, actually asking, asking for someone, especially a stranger for a donation is a little bit, uh, you know, you know, we'll do it very easily. Um, but, uh, my British friends would always say, isn't it true that in America, you know, you have to pay thousands of dollars to go to college through your, through your fees. They don't call it tuition. They call it your fees. Yes, it is. And isn't it also true that then when you, once you graduate, people, you know, donate sometimes thousands of dollars, even more back to the university, even though they already paid all of these exorbitant fees in order to go. (laughs) And I said, yes, that's very, very true. And they said, why would you ever do that? (laughs) (laughs) It's a good question. (laughs) Well, Phil, one of the one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on was because of your involvement in local government. Sure. Um, You uh, and we'll talk a little about that. You are currently on and I don't want to get this wrong. I'll let you say it. uh, What is your elected position? Uh, And then I have a couple questions for you. Sure. So I currently live in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and I live in uh, the borough of West Reading. And if you are listening and you are not uh, familiar with uh, Pennsylvania's form of local governance, um, a borough in Pennsylvania is the equivalent to a town or a village in other states. Um, And so... Uh, I, and, and a borough is like a small town. It has an elected council and I have been on my borough's, uh, borough council for, I'm, uh, I'm entering, I'm in my 13th year. Um, and I've held, you know, I've been the president of council. I've been the vice president of council twice. I'm currently the vice president again. Uh, it's seven elected officials that have to run every four years. Um, the, the the borough is 4,200 residents. So it might sound like a small town, but um, if you know anything a little bit about Burks County geography, we are directly west of the city of Reading, which is a relatively large city uh, if you go by Pennsylvania standards for anything other than Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Of around eighty-nine to ninety thousand residents, so we've got a very big brother right next door to us. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, something that uh, I've done nonstop, like I said, for thirteen years. On top of being well, let me uh, ask you. Th- let me ask you this question, yeah, sure, first, sure. Phil. Why? Why did you decide that this is something you wanted to pursue? Most people, I mean, politics isn't that popular to begin with in the United States, especially. Nope political p- political involvement and if anybody has any interest in politics the majority of people might be just following the news at you know at the federal level they might be able to tell you who their senator is maybe they might be able to tell you who their representative in washington is but i'll bet you there's you know majority of pennsylvanians would have a hard time telling you who their state representative or state senator right. is and i think even when you start talking about local politics whether it's a township supervisor or borough council i think that is so 
uh, foreign to so many Americans. Um, they don't understand how the system works, why it's there maybe, or even just like, who are these people and what power do they have? So what was it about this, about local government that you said, this is something I want to be part of and, and, and run for an elected position? That the answer to that question is a little varied. Um, partly, it, partly influenced by my dad. Um, my dad was never. My dad passed away five years ago, as of two days ago. Um, but when he was around, and I was a kid, he he wasn't an elected official, but he was a volunteer on so many, you know, community boards and. Uh, nonprofits and, and church organizations and church councils and things like that, that the seed of, of, you know, being involved in your community was kind of planted a little early in me. Not that I, and I totally didn't, not that I appreciated that, that my dad was, was being away from home in the evenings a lot of times and doing these types of things to try to serve. Not that I appreciated that at all, because I totally didn't, because I was a dumb kid. Yeah. But uh, as I got older... Um, I, 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 be, I remember being very heavily influenced in my early 20s after, after running into um, some, of your, some of your listeners may know, if you've ever heard of, uh, it's become more popular now, the new urbanist movement, um, which is this, is, is this uh, urban design philosophy that's, uh, you know, you kind of grew out of the 80s and the 90s and where people you're going back to, uh, you know, uh, putting emphasis on main street communities and walkability and, and um, uh, uh, small mom and pop shops and things like that. And I read a, a bunch of books uh, by a particular author that um, I really like a lot. Uh, James Howard Kunstler, uh, who lives in upstate New York. Um, he wrote a couple of really influential books in the nineties that I, I, by total happenstance found in a bargain bin at a borders in Ohio when I was doing some archaeology and totally fell in love with it. And so um, the idea of, you know, increased walkability, urbanization, um, you know, being connected to your community, knowing your neighbors, supporting local businesses, having a, a local resilient economy, all of that stuff, you know, that, that that's very, you know, buzzwordy now uh, what has been a thing in certain architectural and urban planning circles for decades. And when I decided to, you know, what I went to college in State College, and if you've ever been to State College, Pennsylvania, you know, you don't need a car. Uh, and then I lived in London, and I lived in Sheffield, England, and I lived in Boston, downtown Boston. I didn't need a car. So uh, urban locations where you could walk and take advantage of public transportation and things like that very much uh, um, was it was interesting to me. I was very interested in that. When I came back to Berks County in early 2000s, West Reading, which is a very compact urban municipality, had decided to take out $6 million worth of public debt in order to enhance their Main Street, which is a classic American Main Street type feel to it. And I thought to myself, this community gets it. They are leveraging their inherent strengths to try to um, look forward to the future by taking a big financial risk. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so I ended up buying a house here and doing what most people do when you're young. Um, I was in my late 20s and taking advantage of, you know, the restaurants and the bars and the shops and the walkability. And then I thought to myself, you know, um, who's running the show here? Um, who are these people actually running the show? And I got curious. And I started going to borough council meetings. And after the, I mean, I was hooked after the first one. Um, if you've never been to a local government meeting, uh, so much is discussed and talked about it that directly pertains to your daily life. How anybody does not, you know, kick open the door to find out what's going on in their community. I, I don't understand it. 
because yeah, can, my- what, can you speak on maybe why do you think most people are so blase and 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 so about their local government? Is it just a lack of knowledge about it? Do you think, or is it just that we're just so eh, you know I don't even know how to explain it myself. But what do you think is one of the reasons? that most people don't take an interest in because you're right local government is the government that affects you the most in my opinion too you uh, know, on a day-to-day basis not just your opinion it's that's actual that's actual <laughs> fact um you know uh some of it is yes uh i can tell you i, I don't know i can't speak of other states but you know we do a poor job I, i'm a social studies teacher in a public high school in pennsylvania And I taught government for years. The curriculum, to a large degree, does not overly emphasize the importance of local governance. I mean, because if you think about it, local local government is a direct reflection of state and federal government. You have three branches with three distinct jobs. You have a separation of powers and checks and balances. So when I taught government, I would do it the opposite way. I would teach the kids all about local government first and then teach it up to the federal level. Because when was the last time a president or a senator or even a, a house rep had a direct, you know, uh, influence on your life? Right. Uh, versus, say, the guy that lives next door to you that happens to be on the school board or the guy that lives next door to you that happens to be a township supervisor. And they're figuring out, well, should we, you know, should we hire another cop or should we pave that street? Um right. It might not sound like the most important thing, but it's going to have the most direct influence on your daily life. And these people are accessible. They're your neighbors. You can go and talk to them at meetings. You can reach out to them whenever you want, because this is if anybody thinks that you make money being a local elected official, you got another thing coming. Um, Because if I had to bill out for every hour over the last 13 years that I worked for, for this borough, you know, maybe, maybe I would have enough to have a, like a legitimate second job. Um, I get a very small stipend every year of the great, the, 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 the princely sum of $1,500. Um, and I probably spend every month, oh, I don't know, probably 30, 40 hours on borough business. Uh-huh. Um, on top of all the meetings I have to go to, which some months could be like seven, eight, nine meetings. Right. Uh, what do you wish you could change about the system, local government, or your, in particular, your borough council? What's something that you wish, you know, if you had the magic wand that would maybe make the system easier or more accessible, or I I don't know. Well, um, that's a difficult question. I don't want to speak about specifically my municipality. I like to keep it a little bit more general, but, um, I, I think a lot of people don't know how much power they really have in order to influence their own communities. Um, you know, I, I, I never ever in a million years sought out what I do because of, you know, my own ego or seeking higher office or anything like that. All I wanted to do was live in a cool, funky town and help it succeed. That was right. it, you know, and it's funny cause I've had people you can't do this for 13 years and not have people get ticked off at you. Oh, sure. sure. And so th- there, there are people in my community that would rather have me not be elected. Um, but for some reason, they, you know, I always end up with the most votes. Um, and that has nothing to really do with me being a good politician. It just has, me, you know, I think a lot to do with, hey, I'm here to just make sure that things go as as well as they can go. And that's really a, it. And and. No one else is going to get it done other than someone who, you know, it's kind of like that leader get out of the way kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I feel like I'm a really strong leader because I, I don't really think I am. But I get really frustrated when people who can do things don't. Uh, and um, I wanted to be someone that, you know, the day I feel like I am one of those people is the day I'm going to walk away. Mm-hmm. Um because I, I like to get things done. Um, I can be a little impatient in that way. Um, but at the same time, because the, the, I, can, I can tell you, the, the wheels of government, if you think the wheels of government turn slowly on the federal and state level, you know, the local government <laughs> is a little slower because most, most of the time you're dealing with volunteers. Sure. You know, 
Um, and so you got to wait another 30 days for another meeting in order to discuss a very important topic or what have you. But right. I, I don't know if I've answered your question. Um, no, you, yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I've had people literally say to me more than once, you know, uh, they're ticked off about something in their neighborhood and they come to a meeting to talk about it. And they get their say at the beginning of the meeting because we take public comment at the beginning of the meeting. And then they'll stick around just for giggles and grins to see what the rest of the meeting is about. And they'll end up staying for the whole meeting. And sometimes the meeting can go quite late. And then they'll say something like, man, I had no idea that you talk about all that stuff. Hmm. I had no idea that, you know, if I really want to know what's going on, all I got to do is show up once a month to get all the, all the details. <laughs> um, wow, that was really informative. Um, you know, a lot of times, and not so much recently, because unfortunately our local newspaper is kind of dying, um, but we had a normal, we had a reporter that would come to the meetings every month and write up a little snippet in the local newspaper about what happened at the meeting. But they never really, in my opinion, talked about the things that I thought that was the most interesting thing. Sure. You know, they would write up things like, uh, you, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I, I would, I'm like, we talked about 16,000 more things at this meeting and they, they chose to write about these two things that really weren't that important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the high, high school kids, I deal with high school kids. Um, I used to do this thing with them where I would make them and they hated me for it, but I didn't care. I made them take the school district's budget. So they had to go to the school district website and download the budget. And then I made them analyze it and see where all the money goes. And then I told them that you have to make it, you have to make a 10% cut to the budget and you're not allowed to raise taxes. Where are you going to cut? And you have to justify it because then we're going to role play and I'm going to portray, you know, the department head or the Teamsters, uh, you know, union rep or, you know, whatever, the principal as to why you cut my stuff and not somebody else's stuff. Mm -hmm. And they always do the same thing every year. They cut 10% across the board because that seems fair. And then I always got them because I, because then they've got to ask the question, Oh, this is more important than that. Oh, so you're telling me this is more important than that. And then they've got to justify it. And they understand how difficult being a local elected official can really be because quite honestly, the hardest job, of a local elected official in Pennsylvania is not what I do. It's school board members. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Because they don't get, they're not allowed to get paid anything at all. Right. By law. And they have some of the most contentious decisions to make. Absolutely. And are being constantly criticized for things like high millage rates and high taxes. And, you know, why are you building a new football stadium? And blah, my, you, know, you, you name it. Um, it is the most absolute thankless job you could possibly imagine is a school board member trust me on this one yeah um but you know i don't know it's um we live in an age where it's so easy to court yourself off from your family your neighborhood your community your state your government your country we have literally put the ability and here we are in a global pandemic quarantined and the model's proven itself to be effective enough to be able to, like, not have the wheels completely come off. Because I can sit here and I can order my groceries online and I can order my delivery online and I can get my entertainment and I can communicate and I can be artistic and I can, you know, be creative or whatever I want to do as long as I have a strong Internet connection and electricity. Um, that can be. I'm worried when this all ends that we haven't done permanent damage to the idea of community and neighborliness going forward. Yeah. 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 It's something to think about for sure. Absolutely. Well, Phil, this has been great. Uh, I end all of my interviews with 10 quick questions. Uh -oh. uh, oh, here we go. Nothing to worry about. Nothing personal. Well, they're kind of personal, but nothing that's <laughs> embarrassing or anything like that. So are you ready? Sure. Here we go. Question number one. What is your morning drink of choice? Um, <laughs> hot tea. Okay. Cream sugar? 
Both. Okay. Question number two. What or who is a go-to musical artist or group for you? ACDC. Ooh, okay, okay. Number three, what movie can you watch over and over again and it never gets old? So many. Um, Clue. Ooh, that's a good film. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Number four, what's the last thing that you read? A book or magazine? Either, either. Uh, I'm trying to think. Print material or online? Either. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I'm trying to remember here. I, I, I think I might have to take a pass because I. it was probably a magazine. Um, it was probably National Geographic, quite honestly, because I have one next oh, to my yeah. bed stand and I read it when, you know, to get dopey and fall asleep. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Sounds good. Five. What's your favorite pizza topping? Pepperoni. Okay. Six, laying on the beach or going for a hike? Laying on the beach. Okay. Seven, you've invited me over for dinner. What are you cooking? Uh, man, well, I'd have to know what you like, but if I just had to take a stab at it. No, um, just what What do you like to cook? Give me a meal that you really you really like cooking or preparing. Um, I cook a lot. So this okay. is a hard question for me because, because I'm in the kitchen a lot. Um, what do I like to prepare? I don't like baking. Okay. I can tell you that. Uh, I'll, I've done it and I, I can make a hell of a good, um, pumpkin pie, um, <laughs> and cherry pie. But, uh, I probably would go with something re- relatively simple if I really didn't know someone's palate. Uh-huh. Something, you know, probably, you know, a, a chicken dish with, um, you know, um, I'm a, I'm a big rice guy. I love the versatility of rice. Okay. Um, so chicken and, and rice. Okay. Chicken and rice with a, with a nice, you know, side veg, like, you know, roasted asparagus or something like that. Oh, that sounds great. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight. What is a dream vacation destination of yours? Um... This is going to maybe sound a little unpopular right now, but China. Okay. Okay. Number nine, what is something that you're afraid of? Thunder. Oh, okay. And the last one, what job other than your current one would you love to have? Um, probably an urban planner. No, that'd be cool. Yeah. I yeah. think you'd fit that. I think you'd fit into that yep. really, really well. <laughs> yeah. I think I would, uh, I think I would enjoy that. If I, if I was about 15 years younger, I probably would have switched careers at this point. Okay. Well, Phil, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. We talked about some great stuff. You brought back some great memories for me from my time abroad. And I think it's so important that we had this discussion about local government because like you, I'm a big proponent of people getting involved, even if it's just going to meetings, not necessarily serving. If they want to sure. serve, that's great. No, no. But just just going to meetings, listening what's going on so that you're informed uh, and you're not just t- getting all your information off somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about. So right. I think that was really important for uh, hopefully for our listeners uh, to hear that and and hopefully they got something out of that. Yep. Thank you so much I, yep. for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, me. it's been a real treat. Um, I thought this was a really great, uh, a really great conversation. Um, I hope uh, you and the listeners out there in Internet land um enjoyed it as well and stuck around after the first two or three minutes hopefully we didn't bore you to death um but uh sure it's been fun well thanks phil yeah absolutely so Thank you for listening to Doug's Front Porch, a conversational podcast with your host, Doug Maidenford. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow along on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and please feel free to tell all your friends about the show. I'll see you all next time on My Front Porch. <laughs>